I want to welcome you to Easter Sunday morning. We have been stepping into the story of God over the past weeks. And this morning, we come to the climax of the story itself as we step into the story to which all the other stories that we have stepped into over the past weeks find their ultimate fulfillment. Today, we, we come to step together into the story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I want to proclaim to you this morning, He is risen! And I can hear you now uh, in your homes, in your living rooms, uh, responding back with that proclamation, He is risen indeed! In fact, um, I think I could hear, hear you kind of reverber reverberating into my home this morning. Uh, well, I'd love to have us proclaim it again this morning before we, went, we enter into the scripture together. Uh, but um, I'm reminded, even though we can't be physically together today as the body of Christ, within our church building, spiritually we're connected. We're connected today through His Holy Spirit. And, and I know that as I say He is risen in your heart and even with your lips, you're saying He is risen indeed. So let's say it again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Well, I'd like to ask if you would turn with me this morning as we step into the story of resurrection to the Gospel of John. We've been reading in John. If you've been reading through the New Testament with us through these weeks, we've now entered into the Gospel of John. And so we're going to look at um, a portion today where we find Mary Magdalene stepping into the story of resurrection. And I think it gives us a great entrance to step into the story of resurrection as well. And so would you follow along with me as I read verses 1 to 2 in chapter 20 and then verses 11 to 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. Down to verse 11, we continue to read. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking that he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will get him. Jesus said, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Well, it was early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and, and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. John, in his gospel, he masterfully paints pictures using vivid imagery of, of things like light and dark and day and night. And he uses these images uh, to reveal God's purposes in and through Jesus, through his life and his death and his resurrection. And so it's not an unimportant detail in John's gospel as he uses these double uh, meanings, they, they call them double entendres, to, to point out the reality of Jesus and paint the picture of, of who he is and what he came to do. Mary comes to the empty tomb while it is still dark, John says. Everything, I'm reminded, everything looks so different in the dark. Everything looks different in the dark. In, in the Gospel of John, we find that John uses these images of light and dark from the very beginning. In fact, in the very beginning of the Gospel in chapter 1, we, we see that 
that, that John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And of course, he's talking about Jesus Christ. And he goes on and says, through him all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. And in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We could continue to see all kinds of examples in the Gospel of John, where John paints these pictures of darkness and light, of light and darkness. What we see at the Feast of the Tabernacles in chapter 8, that Jesus says these words. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In chapter 9, when Jesus heals a man who has been born blind from birth, uh, his disciples have asked him the question, um, who sinned, is this man or his parents? And Jesus says, neither of them, neither of them sinned. But this, this happened so that the very works of God might be displayed and glorified in this man's life. And, and Jesus says this in the midst of that very scene. As long as, as it is day, Jesus says, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am, the, am, in, while I am in the world, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Uh, Jesus will actually heal this man and restore his sight. And the man really doesn't know exactly who, who Jesus is yet. But uh, the Pharisees are badgering this man after he's healed because they've heard Jesus healed him. And they keep badgering him and saying that, that Jesus is demon-possessed and a sinner. And finally the man in frustration blurts out, Whether this man's a sinner or not, I do not know. But the one thing that I do know, I was blind and now I can see. We can see these images continue, continuing to roll in John's Gospel. In chapter 11, as Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, towards Jerusalem anyway, in order to stop on the way to, to where Lazarus he has heard has died. And he's going so that he can raise Lazarus from the dead. And his disciples question him why he would even go towards Jerusalem since the leaders there, the religious leaders, intend to kill him. And Jesus answers them this way. Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble. For they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. And then as Jesus entered into Jerusalem for the final Passover week, where he'll ultimately die as the sacrificial lamb for the sins of the world, Jesus tells the crowd, you're going to have the light just a little longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. For whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. And a few moments later, he says, I've come into the world as light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. And then there's one foreboding kind of scene, one final scene, where we see Jesus eating this final meal with his disciples. He's washed their feet and now he's sharing a meal with them, and he's now predicting that one of them will betray him. It will be Simon Iscariot, uh, Simon Iscariot's son, Judas. And, and as Jesus tells Judas uh, to go and do what he's about to do quickly, because Jesus is predicting his betrayal, John paints the picture vividly as Judas leaves to betray Jesus. John says, writes, he went out and it was night. Mary went to the tomb while it was still dark. She went there and she saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. And everything looked different in the dark. It, it, it always does. And John was signaling that everything that morning, on that very first resurrection morning for Mary, was is in chaos. N.T. Wright, who comments on this passage, writes, For the moment, the empty tomb is simply for Mary another twist of the knife. Chaos upon chaos. Someone has taken him away. No faith. No hope. No maybe after all. Maybe after all, something good would happen. Jesus would rise. Just a cruel trick. Some gardener, some laborer, some soldier, someone servant. But we must find out. And T. Wright paints the picture well. Have you ever experienced uh, how everything can look different in the dark? 
Have you ever visited a, a, a place in the daytime only later to, to visit it in the, in the dark and the nighttime and it was all different? Maybe it was a hike in the woods. Maybe it was a, a tour of an old house or an old barn. In the daytime, as you walk into the woods, you can see the details and vibrant color of, of, of the, the trees and the leaves and the, the woods as you walk through them. Uh, and yet, the very same woods, when you walk into them at night, are filled with shadows and, and everything takes on a new shape. Things are not as clear. Trees look like sometimes fierce animals or monsters. The, the place that was serene and peaceful now casts shadows and small things cast big shadows, images of chaos and threat. Uh, many years ago when I lived in Muskegon, Michigan, I, uh, I was um, into bow hunting and I, I loved to bow hunt. Uh, I hunted on a piece of, piece of uh, uh, state property that was not real far from Muskegon and, and it offered great hunting. And so I went out and, uh, to scout the land before I would go out for the opening day of bow hunting and and so I scouted and found where the deer were moving in a, a good way and a great tree and I scoped it out and I, I marked my tree and then I just kind of rehearsed the entire trail into that into that tree from my car to the tree and and um, I, I walked out and went home uh, and then opening day I got up early five six o'clock I went with, while it was still dark <laughs> and uh, that's when a good hunter goes out to hunt and I got up on that opening morning, I drove my car into the parking lot of, of the state property, I, I opened the trunk, I arranged all my equipment, and I, and I began to take my hike into the spot that I had, that I had picked out. But as I hiked, I, it seemed like I went further and further and further and, and still even further, further, further yet. And, and it just got really, really, really frustrating. Everything looked so, so, so different in the dark. And finally, I realized that I was actually seeing some things over again as I was going further and further. And then all of a sudden, it dawned on me. I realized that I was actually walking in circles all that time. And after doing that on more than one occasion, after thinking I'd, fig I'd figure it out the next time and the next time, I finally decided to take some reflective tacks that they make for the very purpose, put them into the trees at about eye level, all the way to the tree where my spot was. And so that I wouldn't miss next time. That they would be signs, these tacks, all the way to my spot, all the way to my destination. And John's gospel is like that. John is providing signs. In fact, the, the gospel has seven signs. That All those signs lead, like those reflective tacks, they lead us all the way to the very resurrection of Jesus Christ himself. Everything looks different in the dark. You start a semester of school, you get books, you're excited, you attend the first class, you get the syllabus, it, all kinds of potential you have a, is before you, you have a clean slate, but just to, as you get to weeks later at midterm, or, or maybe even weeks later than that, you're coming close to finals, papers are due, and all the work is piling in upon you, and, and, and all of a sudden you're wondering if you're going to get the grade that you'd wanted to, and, and, it, and it just can feel very, very dark in those moments, can it? Um, Sometimes it, it, you walk into a moment where it's daylight and all of a sudden it's so different in the dark. The same classroom feels so different. Uh, there are times that physical struggles bring darkness into our lives. Uh, one moment you're fine, you're, you're feeling well, you're healthy, the life is good, sky's blue, and the next moment the doctor observes something concerning your health and tests are ordered and you're sent home to wait for results. I remember a time like that for Leslie and I. Um, she had gone to the doctor and, and um, the doctor ordered a test because of a serious concern that he, that he had because on an x-ray that he took, there, there was concern. Um, they were concerned it would be serious and, and if it would have turned out to be what they thought it would have been. And so the, she went and, and um, had uh, some tests done and, and then we went home or she went home and we were together just waiting and waiting and waiting for the conclusion of those tests to be re revealed to us. Um, and when they came back, uh, we were so, so thrilled because the x-ray just showed um, just that it was a shadow. But during those days, the blue sky seemed dark and it was like we could hardly breathe, but when we found out um, that she was okay, that there was no problem, it was just a shadow, um, we, we found that the whole day changed, everything around us did. Everything looks different in the dark. 
we're facing as a country right now something that feels that way. One day you're driving wherever you want to drive and going wherever you want to go, visiting whoever you want to visit. The, the coronavirus, even a month ago or so, it was seem, seemed for us far off. Um, it was somewhere else, someone else. Yes, we were concerned for those people who were dealing with it, but we hadn't faced it ourselves. And then the COVID-19 pandemic blew wide open. Social distancing guides, stay-at-home orders, uh, businesses closing out of necessity, workers being laid off and furloughed, uh, near-empty freeways, and the stock market um, tumbling. Although we live in the exact same place as two or three months ago, everything looks different in the dark. In the dark, the very same place looks very different. In the dark, we, we see a different world. And, and I'm reminded that Mary saw a different world as she walked into that very first resurrection morning. And John paints that she came early in the morning in the dark. In the dark, we feel anxious. We experience grief. We experience loss of control. We feel like the chaos is threatening to take away our, our peace. Uh, this was the experience of Mary that resurrection morning. She had followed Jesus and she had heard him say that he was the light of the world. And, and she had witnessed Jesus, Jesus and his teachings and his healings. Um, the very love of God expressed through him in a hurting and broken world. But in these moments, Mary comes to the tomb and and she reveals that she's still blanketed in the darkness of Friday's crucifixion and Saturday's silence. The stone being rolled back for Mary is not a, not a sign of, uh, of something good. It's not a sign that it's happened. For her, she's still under the cloak of darkness. Darkness that brought chaos into Mary's life and invaded her peace, her well-being, her shalom. And you can feel the panic and you can feel the sense of her loss of control and her loss of of purpose. And so as we continue to read John's portrait this morning, we read that while it was still dark, Mary finds the tomb with the stone rolled away. And so she comes running to Simon, Peter, and the other disciple, and she says to them, they, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know. We don't know. We don't know where they put him. Mary's anxiety and her hopelessness are formed in that exclamation, we don't know, that sense of loss of control. She surely was thinking to herself, at least we had this one last thing, to come to the grave and to, to grieve and to, to treat uh, our, our rabbi uh, in, a, in a way that was honoring to him. Uh, but once again, coming to verse 18, we see Mary outside the tomb weeping. And instead of rejoicing at the, end of, at the empty tomb, she, she weeps. As readers, you know, we already know the end of the story. We know that Jesus has been raised from the grave. We know she should be rejoicing. And yes, she's weeping, and that's the tension of the passage. But this time, it's the angels who she encounters. And there's one who is sitting uh, on the, at the head and one at the foot where Jesus' body had laid. And they ask her, why are you crying? And she repeats the very same storyline, as you, we just said, you, that they had taken the Lord away, her Lord, and, they, and she didn't know where they put him. Mary rehearses the story in this present moment of darkness in her life. And because it's the only story that she can imagine, the story of darkness in which Jesus has been tragically crucified, died and buried and and worse yet now, his body has been stolen. In the dark, the chaos extinguishes Mary's peace, driving away that peace. In the dark, Mary's at a loss, not knowing where everything's headed. And we can understand and feel this loss, can't we, church, this morning? In the dark, it feels like it's really never going to end. We feel like we're continuing to circle and coming back to the same spot we were at over and over again when we feel like there's a cloak of darkness over us. And the dark makes the small things seem so big. And the large things seem like insurpassable mountains. In the pandemic, we're facing the 24-hour the, the news cycle. The, we hear the story constantly being rehearsed and rehashed over and over and over again. And of course, for reporters, we, we understand that because they don't have a whole lot 
to, to gain ratings right now. There's no sports, and they tell us even the crime rates kind of dipped right now because of people being inside. Of course, that may change as time goes. But we're constantly being reminded of the difficulties and, and we find, that we find ourselves in in these moments. And Like Mary, our world just keeps on rehearsing over and over and over and over again the story of present darkness. Now, I know we need to hear the news and I know we need to be informed and I'm so glad for that and all of those things. But sometimes doesn't it feel like it's being rehearsed? I mean, 24-7 we hear the story of the difficulty in darkness. And when we don't know what's happened or what, what can come of all of this, we can lose our sense of peace as well, our sense of wholeness, our, our sense of well-being. And, and this is not an easy time. There's much struggle and difficulty. It's very real. It's, they're not just small things making big shadows. People have become ill. Many have died. Others have lost jobs and income. There's much that, that could cause us to rehearse and live in that story of the present struggle and darkness that we might feel. And while we should grieve for those who grieve, and I believe that fully, and while we should ache for our broken world, and we need to do that fully, and while we need to be informed and act in ways of, of, of Christ-like love in this time, and we need to do that to the fullest extent, we're also being called to see what Mary is about to see. And so immediately after Mary rehearses the story now for a second time, John writes that she turns around. And as she turns around, she, it says that she saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't realize that it was Jesus. She's weeping and she's crying. And so Jesus asked her, just like the angels had moments before, Woman, why are you crying? But he goes further than that and says, Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking that he was the gardener, she rehearses the story one more time, a third time. Sir, she says, if you've carried him away, and that's the story, right? That's the storyline. If you've carried him away, please tell me where you put him and I'll, I'll go get him. How often are we like Mary? In the place where all we can see at the moment is this present darkness. All we can see is the story of chaos and loss. And we see that as the final word. We can't seem to pull ourselves out of it. We just keep on rehearsing the story, going in circles over and over again in frustration. We've all been there, haven't we? One of my favorite pastors and authors is Eugene Peterson. And, and Eugene Peterson translated the, the message that many of us have read and love. In his book entitled, Living the Resurrection, Eugene Peterson writes, The land of the living is dangerous country. A lot goes wrong. There's a lot of trouble brewing out there out there and in here. Resurrection takes place, Peterson writes, in the country of death. Did you hear that? What he said, it's so powerful. The, the land of the living is dangerous country. We don't need any reminders of that today, do we? A lot goes wrong. There's a lot of trouble brewing out there and in here. Resurrection takes place in the country of death. But how often are we like Mary? The resurrected Jesus is standing in, right in the midst of our country of death, so to speak. He's standing right in, in our midst and he's walked right into our circumstances, but we do not recognize him. But then comes the turning point in the entire story with Mary Magdalene. And it's the, it's the turning point really for all of us in all of our stories. Jesus does something. Jesus calls Mary by name. So Jesus says her name, Mary. And she turns toward him and she realizes it's him and she cries out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. The turning point in Mary's story came when Jesus entered in, into her present darkness and called her by name. And, and it comes in our stories in the exact same way when Jesus enters into our present darkness and calls you and I by name. And when Jesus calls her by name, everything changes and, and the echoes of Isaiah 43 come to our hearts. We're there, we read, but, but now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And then we're reminded of Jesus' own words. When he speaks of himself as the good shepherd and he, he says that, 
As a good shepherd, he calls his own sheep and leads them out. And his sheep follow, them, follow him because, because they know his voice. When we hear Jesus calling out our name, church, and I hope you hear him calling out your name this morning, everything changes. We're in the same place. But it's as though the world gets turned upside down and inside out and right side up in a single breath, in a moment. Just as God breathed over the formless and empty darkness of, uh, in that very first chapter of Genesis. He breathes his breath and brings into being creation. The very creation comes into being as he breathes over it the formlessness and the void and the, and the chaos. So we now see Jesus breathing a word to Mary in the midst of the darkness and emptiness and chaos of her life. And as he breathes that word, a brand new creation is birthed into existence, is birthed into her heart. And I'm reminded today that when Jesus breathes his word, when he was raised from the grave, it was just with one breath of, of, of his very life coming into being, his very resurrected being, and the very breath that he spoke that the new creation took its form. And this is the purpose of John's entire gospel. He, he's revealing these signs. He's giving signs all through the gospel. In fact, there are seven signs we know in the gospel of John that all lead us in a trail, just like those reflective tacks. They lead us all the way to that resurrection morning to see who God is in all of his fullness. And John's great purpose is to give us these signs that lead us to this great reality of this brand new world, this brand new kingdom, this brand new creation, this new creation where the old is becoming new. Um, and so we, we were reminded immediately of this very first chapter of John's gospel where he says, through him, through Jesus, all things were made. Nothing was made that was made without him. And in him was life, and that life was the light of mankind. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John gives his purpose for writing his gospel when he writes in chapter 20 that Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are, that are not recorded in this book. But he goes on and says, but these signs, these signs that are written, they're written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Just like those reflective tacks um, I put on the pathway that I could reach the spot in my woods, so also John's gospel puts the reflection, the reflective moments, the signs of Jesus, his healings, uh, all the way through the gospel that lead us all the way to the brand new creation and resurrection morning. With a single breath, Jesus has pierced Mary's darkness, and he pierces ours. She hears a resonant voice, a familiar voice, that, that calls to her, and she knows it's the voice of the one who can heal her heart, and and bring her into that brand new world. It's a voice that awakened her to the new reality of resurrection. It's the voice that awakened her to a brand new world. She was in the same place, but it had become so different in just one single breath. And my prayer for you this morning is that wherever you're at, no matter what you're going through, no matter what the chaos or the struggle may be, that on this Resurrection Sunday morning, that you will hear, that you will sense the voice of God, the voice of Jesus Christ through His Holy Spirit speaking over your life and calling you into His new creation, a new world, a world of peace. In fact, two times Jesus will, will enter through locked doors after this very day, where the disciples are huddled in fear, and he, and he will say to them, as he stands among them, peace be with you. It's a new world, not only of peace, but of light and of life. It's a new world that has emerged and smack dab in the middle of the old world, the old world of chaos. It's in this old world of chaos that peace has now emerged to subdue the chaos of our world through Jesus. It's a world of darkness, this world, world of darkness, it's in the midst of this world of darkness that, that Jesus has emerged and the light pierces the darkness. It's in this world of death, death in the midst of this world where death seems so present. Jesus overcomes death through his life. He dies, he takes on death full force that he might overcome sin, death, and the grave. <laughs> wow, it's powerful. Jesus 
tells Mary that he's going to ascend to the Father. To go to tell the disciples that's what's going to happen. That he's going to his Father and their Father, to their God and his God. Of course, that means Jesus will reign at the right hand of the Father. He's now King. He's now Lord. He, he reigns over sin and death and over the powers of chaos. Jesus not only entered Mary's present darkness, but church this morning, he entered the present darkness of our entire world. He took the powers of this dark world full force upon himself. He took our brokenness and our pain and our sin, and he overcame it through the cross. He went to the grave, but he didn't stay there. He rose on the third day. And he calls us out of the darkness into his wonderful light because he's defeated it today. So on this most unusual Easter today, we face a lot of unknowns. We've been made to face the fact that we don't control what we thought we could control. We're, we're facing a, a great level of brokenness in our world, and we're even being, being made to reflect on our own mortality like we never have before. We're facing the reality that, and threat of physical death itself within our present culture, as you know, and this, these days we hear it every day. But there's great news, good news. The good news of Jesus is that he has taken our present darkness upon himself. He's pierced our darkness with his unconquerable love and life and will never be the same. And so Mary was awakened by Jesus calling her name and she couldn't contain the news. And so she went to the disciples with the news and said, I've seen the Lord. I've seen the Lord. She became the first evangelist, the first apostle sent to tell the news of resurrection life. What an amazing thing. It's a, she was sharing something that they could hardly get their hands around and their minds around. Yes, everything looks different in the dark. But there's something I should say today. I should tell you this. One more time, there's someone who's pierced that darkness. And when Jesus pierced that darkness, the darkness of our old world, it awakened everything. It awakened everything to new life. As I woke up just yesterday morning, I could hear the birds and the sun, and, and it was shining, and, and it was like the, and it was an awakening. You could just hear them everywhere. But I'm reminded that when that first resurrection morning happened, everything was awakened, awakened for us in our world for you and I. So we know that if we come to know Christ personally, we can know this very, this very resurrection life. Eugene Peterson, though, in his book, um, Living the Resurrection, entitles one of the sections, The Loss of Our Resurrection Identity. And in that section of that book, there's a warning for us this morning. Eugene Peterson talks about how we can regress. Once we've known Christ, we can be dulled in our senses, and we can lose the sense of what this resurrection is all about. He says the regression is rarely dramatic. It's not sudden. We start out with life, 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 and more life. God is primary. God is present in everything that we do, Peterson writes. But then, while we're happily and innocently going about our work, our feet get tangled up in those cords of Sheol, those ropes of death. It is so casual at first that we hardly even notice it. But then one cord gets attached. Who knows how? Or to an ankle maybe by a double half hitch. Then there's another and another. And before we know it, we're regressing. We're hobbled. We become less. We lose the immediacy, the spontaneity, and the exuberance of resurrection life itself. And Eugene Peterson reminds us of Jesus' words. When a person walks at night, they will stumble. For they have no light. It reminds us of his words, whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. This morning, church, I'm reminded that we don't want to lose the freshness of the resurrection of Jesus. I'm reminded this morning that as we're here in these moments, as we're, as we're looking to his word, that like Mary, we can be awakened. Don't allow your resurrection identity to grow cold. Don't allow that to happen. And how can you know that that's happened slowly but surely? Well, um, we, can know, we can ask some questions of ourselves. Are we still experiencing the immediacy of Jesus' presence in our lives? Are we still experiencing the leadings of the resurrected Spirit of Christ leading us spontaneously as we hear His voice calling 
Do we still have a sense of the exuberance of this new creation of God, this kingdom of God that we get to play a part in? If not, we might just, we might just be regressing. Church, may our stories be shaped not by the 24-hour news cycle. May we be informed by it, but may we never be shaped by it. Rather, may we be shaped by the resurrected Jesus who does not downplay or ignore our present darkness. He, he admits it's there, but he tells us that in this world we'll, we'll have trouble, but he's overcome the world. He's overcome it with his unconquerable life. May we not lose our resurrection identity. And then I want to talk to you, maybe that you've never come into this identity for yourself. There may be some today who are hearing his voice for the very first time. And this morning, across the satellite signals, you're hearing my words. But more than that, through the Holy Spirit, you're hearing God's word, God speaking your name. Today, you can step into the story of resurrection life. Will you step into that story this morning? Church, let's be renewed in our resurrection identity. Folks who, you folks who maybe this morning have never heard him call your name, may you hear him call it. And as I pray this morning, if you've heard him call it, would you pray a prayer to receive Jesus? There's a button this morning on our platform, Moments. You can push that, you can push that button, click on that button, and raise your hand if you receive Jesus because you've heard him call your name today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, this morning as we, as we close this service, this, this Resurrection Sunday, this message, we, we pray that we would never lose our resurrection identity, that we, we would be kept fresh, that, that we realize that you, you are leading us into your great kingdom, into a brand new world. And Father, that you've planted that world of your kingdom and your life and your love and your peace in our hearts. And we pray, Father, that, that as well today, if there's anybody who's never heard their name being called by you, that today, Father, they would ask you to come into their hearts and lives. They would recognize you're span, sp standing right in their chaos, right in their darkness, meeting them where they are, and they would ask you to become their Savior today. Father, if they did that today, I pray that they would click that button and they would raise their hand that they now have come into resurrection life. We give you all the praise for all of this today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, would you close with me this morning with a great benediction by saying it once again. He is risen. <laughs> he is risen indeed. Praise God. May God go with you as you walk in resurrection life.